and welcome back to my channel unless you're new here and it's just welcome to my channel my name is rusty and this is me channel where i talk about my favorite movies mostly horror and my favorite music mostly metal and yeah we are going to continue with day two of zombie fest and we are going to continue the quarantine story with quarantine to terminal I just have to do this. I love this fucking movie. Um, I was very, very shocked about this movie, actually. Um, and so were a lot of people, I think. Um, the guys at Bloody Disgusting, right? Official critics. Um, they called this better than the first quarantine. And um, they gave it a very positive reviews. Um I was shocked to find out that this was not a theatrical movie. This was a direct-to-video sequel to Quarantine. And um, if I had known that when I first watched it, I probably would have been even more shocked than I was when I found that out later. Um, because this movie is so good. Um, the actors are so good. There is absolutely nothing direct to video, which I guess just shows you you shouldn't judge things like that because you can have a flawless movie that you just didn't have a distribution contract or couldn't afford a distribution contract to the theaters or something like that. There's lots of reasons why, you know, and so, yeah, you really shouldn't judge. Um, if you have not seen this, you really should. Uh, don't. You know, it, it. this cost me. <laughs> it's pretty rare. Uh, it's a little bit more rare to get a hold of, at least where I shop on eBay and occasionally Amazon. I try not to shop on Amazon, but um, Walmart online, eBay, this is very, it's a little bit more expensive than your usual movie. But, uh, yeah, Quarantine 2 was released in 2011, directed and written by John Pogue and stars Mercedes Mason, phenomenal, Josh Cook, and Maddie Liptak. Um, there's the kid, Maddie Liptak. Yeah. Let me tell you, Mercedes Mason as um, Jenny and Maddie Liptak as George, the, the little 13-year-old boy, they are phenomenal. This is like, I, I didn't, there was not one eye roll from me. There was not, this is cheap from me. There was nothing like that. I was like entranced by this movie the first time I saw it. I was like, this is fucking good, man. <laughs> and, and by the time it got to the end, you know, when the credits rolled, I, I remember because I only got this like a few weeks ago. And when I watched it, when the credits rolled at the end, you know, I was like, fuck, that was good. <laughs> and then when I watched it a second time, um, a couple of days ago to, you know, get the to script and get these ready, I was like, I didn't fast forward one second. You know what I mean? I watched the whole movie again. And was just as entranced. And even though I knew what was coming now, I was still like, this is, it, it reinforced what I thought the first time that I saw it. And that was that this really is a really good movie. Um, done very, very well. So I can't, I can't praise it enough. Is it better than, a, than Quarantine? Well, the guys at Bloody Disgusting said it was. Um, all I can say about it is that I can understand why they would say that. Um, I'm not really sure if I think it's just equal or if I think it's like just a hair, like 8 and 8.1. You know what I mean? 7.9 and 8, maybe like 1 point. But I can certainly see where they thought that this was better than the original Quarantine. Um, so yeah, let's get 
to it. Quarantine 2, 2011, subtitled Terminal, and you will understand why. Quarantine 2, Terminal. Okay, so we are introduced at the movie in a cab, a taxi. We are introduced to Jenny and Paula. Jenny and Paula are stewardesses. Steward, stewardesses. They work for, uh, they're showing up for flight TSR 318. Um, it's a late night flight. And um, they are showing up to work it. So we are introduced to them. It's a flight from L.A. to Kansas. We are introduced to Captain Forrest and co-captain Wiley. Um, Wiley has already kind of like got a cold. He's like, you know, they're like, what's wrong with you? And he's like, he's got a cold. Like, I've got a head cold, man. I don't know. You know, but he's sneezing and he's like red eyes and stuff like that. So... Um, he tells them that he thinks he got it from his dog. And that all of the dogs in his neighborhood seem to be like acting sickly or something and barking and showing their ass all the time. So, Jen is selected to be, it's like her and Paula like do the rock, paper, scissors because they're informed that they have an underage passenger and, you know, someone has to be designated as the guardian. So they do rock, paper, scissors. And um, Jenny is the one chosen. She loses. And so she has to be the guardian of this five days from turning 13. So he's like just a, he's less, less than a week from turning 13. So he's 13. Um, but there's this little 13-year-old boy named George, so she's taken out to meet him. She brings him onto the plane um, and uh, gets him in a seat. And then we are introduced to um, a very good cast of characters. We are introduced to Doc, Dr. Kingston. He's this old guy with Parkinson's who can't speak, and he is in a wheelchair, and his wife, Beverly... Um, we are introduced to Fat Man Ralph um, and Shyla, which is a pre-med student, uh, a medical student. Henry, we are introduced to Henry. Now, Henry's got a carry-on tote, and he says that it's he's a teacher, and he says that it's got amsters. Um, his class is hamsters for his class now he's trying to put it in an overhead right and Jenny's like I don't know if you can really have those up here I think they should be in the cargo hold um, and the fat guy Ralph he like hey man I'll help you and so they're trying to get it in there and one of the hamsters bites him on the finger and that's when Jenny says, no, you, you can't have those up here. So she makes him take them, and they put them in the cargo hold. So everything's fine, you know, and uh, who else? We're introduced uh, to Preston, um, who's going for a business meeting, uh, I mean, a job interview. We have Louise and her cat, Miss Louise and her cat. We have couples Neil and Susan. And Nika and Vorst. Obviously, they're like Norway, uh, you know, Scandinavian, um, Swedish, or something. So it's a very, very good cast of characters. And they're they're all act great. They, you know, there's no like bad acting or anything. So they take off. We've been introduced to everybody, and they take off. Um. It isn't long before you can tell that Neil, and he's got a really weird way of spelling his name that I actually, N-I-A-L-L. -L. And I'm like, Neil, Neil. But then when they talk, 
his name is Neil. And I'm like, well, that's just an unusual way to spell Neil. But that's cool, actually. So Neil and Henry, they like get into a little argument over Neil's use of the cell phone. And so you've got a little bit right there. Now, it isn't long, sort of like in Quarantine, uh, the, the uh, first movie, it isn't long before shit starts because Ralph starts feeling bad, the, the fat guy that was bit by the hamster. He starts feeling bad, and he's like, I need some water, you know, and they start getting concerned about him, Paula and Jenny, you know, um, are kind of getting concerned about him, and it doesn't take it long before he gets sick enough that Jenny ends up going back there. She alerts the, the captain, and then she goes back there, and he's facing away from her, and he turns around, and that dude is gone. Like, first-class zombie right there. And he, like, vomits all over her, and she freaks out, and the action starts. Of course, the other passengers are like, what the fuck? is going on oh great we're all going to get sick um she runs and tells the captain trying to clean herself up she's really grossed out they need to put a mask on him um and help him so paula gets a mask on jenny gets a mask on they go back there and try to help him get the mask on and stuff like that he starts fighting. He comes running down the hall. There's this big giant. You know, everybody is freaking out. This dude has lost it. And he's a big double cheeseburger of zombie. You know what I'm saying? So they're having con problems controlling him. And they finally get him down. Even little George jumps on his back and is like thrown across the room. So they do manage to get him down finally. And when they do, Paula gets up to try to put a mask on him and she's got her mask on you know she gets right up to his face and all and then there's like a bump of turbulence and ralph's hungry and he like bites her right in the face i mean like right across the top of her nose blood just gushes it's like oh my god so she's freaking out as you can imagine and everybody's freaking out He's flipping out again, this Ralph guy. They managed to get him locked into the to the loo, to the bathroom. So they managed to get him locked in there. Now, of course, the whole time, Wiley has been looking through the peephole of the captain thing because Ralph was trying to get in there. Uh, the captain, of course, is now contacted. You know, we got to have we got to make an emergency landing somewhere. And he's told them about this sickness, you know, and they have to make an emergency landing. Paula brings mask, about you in the face. You see, I'm getting with my notes. So they make this emergency landing, right? And the captain gets a message that do not approach a gate and the captain's like fuck that because that particular airline said do not approach our gate so he just rides up to a tsa gate right and the guy at the gate he's like what are you doing here you're you're pulling up you know he's like you know there's little lights there he's like this isn't your gate and um, they pull up to it, but he's like, okay. And so he hooks the he hooks the gate tube up to it. And the first thing he says, his name is Ed. And the first thing he said is like, this isn't your airline's gate. What are you doing pulling up here? You know, and they're like, we got a medical emergency. We got to get Paula, you know, to the, the hospital and stuff like that. So he lets them in. And he's like, okay, okay you know, this way. So he takes them through what we, what are you as airline passengers see when you go through that gate and you go out into the airport. But when he gets to the airport door, 
it, it, it won't open. It's locked. And he's like, and they won't open the door into the airport from that terminal. So he's like, well, we can go through, we can go through the maintenance bay and get out that door. I mean, passengers aren't supposed to come through here, but okay. So they go through there and they try to get through that door, but that door is locked too. And he tries to raise the garage door things. He tries to raise them. Mm -mm, they won't raise either. So you have these passengers. Now the captain and Wiley have stayed on the plane to make sure that Ralph doesn't get out the bathroom. And so you have these passengers and he's like, Ed's like calling, like going, why is all of the doors locked? What the fuck's going on? Then they hear it. Lights are everywhere. Copters. Um, and they inform Ed that they are not opening the door. And it would be very, very fatal of him and anyone else if they do come out. <laughs> uh, that they will be shot on sight. So, just like happened in the apartment building, this CDC like surrounds this terminal. Covers it in plastic closes up everything, seals it up, just like they had done that apartment building. So you have all these passengers, like, not knowing what the hell's going on. And, um, he is informed that they are on lockdown, that they are on quarantine, and that the CDC will be coming to help them, but they will not be getting out until then. Now, that's when they say, well, what the fuck do we do in here? So they start trying to deal with their own problems. First of all, Paula is extremely damaged, right? <laughs> she just had half her face bitten off. So Shyla, who is, you know, is like, my med kit is in the cargo hold. So Jenny takes... Neil and Henry and Preston, because Preston wants his laptop. So they all go back to the plane. When they get to the plane, though, they can't find the captain and they can't find Wiley. So both the captains are gone and they can't find Ralph. He's not in the bathroom. So Ed ends up helping them. They get down into the cargo hold through the hole in the floor. And while they're down there, Neil gets his gun. Preston waits up there. Um, Neil, a rat, comes after Neil. And Neil, like, even fires the gun, you know. And they're like, what the fuck? <laughs> You know, how, why do you have a gun in the cargo hold? Remember, this is 2011, so this is before, you know, um, things are the way they are now. But, and he's like, well, look at what's happened to us. Bringing a gun on board should be like mandatory. <laughs> so, and, uh, so they were talking about the rat and, um, she gets the med kit. They start to go back out. There's Preston's laptop. It's covered in blood. They can't find him. And then Jenny, and this is like a really creepy scene, because Jenny is like looking down between the seats, because you know everything's dark. So she's looking down between the seats, and you see Wiley come from out into the hall, or comes out from behind the seat, on his hands and knees, like a fucking dog, like an animal. And he, like, looks at her, and you're like, oh, wait. <laughs> That's scary looking. And then he, like, he, he goes on. It was really, he moved so animalistically. It was really cool. Um, And then that's when she, like, thinks she gets that something's close to me feeling. 
and she turns around and it's zombie captain like obviously ralph got them you know what i'm saying or maybe wally had it all along but either way the captain's gone and bim bam boom big fight um preston kills him with the gun so henry neil and jenny they all go back with the med kit the big med thing that she uh shyla had brought so shyla is in there trying to fix up paula the best she can and on the way they run into bev to beverly oh another thing while they were in there in the plane jenny runs across the doc the doctor the guy with parkinson's and the and the chair he's just been there the whole time everybody's just forgotten about him <laughs> And the poor man can't, like, talk or anything. So she's like, oh, my goodness, we forgot this dude on the plane. So they bring they, they had brought the doc with them. They run into his wife, though, on the way back. And um, she's been taken. So bim, bam, boom. You've got Preston dead in the hall. You've got Beverly is, is turned. You've got Ralph, who the fuck knows where, looking for a Papa John's, I imagine. You know, so... The two captains, so you've got them. So they shut the terminal doors, and it's like, well, those are in there. We're in here. And then they start, like, talking. So this is when Jenny, like, takes control. She, like, kind of breaks down a little bit. Like, I don't know what to do. I'm just a stewardess. But then she, like, bucks up. And this is also when George, the little 13-year-old boy, he starts, and this was a surprise in the movie, is that he starts taking a lot more prominent role in this movie right here at this point. Because he's the one that helps her, like, buck up and take control of this situation. Um, so George starts taking a bigger role in this and part of that is when d takes control she comes in there and she gives them that little samuel l jackson speech from deep space nine she gives like her version of that takes control now while this is happening we see a rat white red-eyed rat and that poor old man in that wheelchair, because she's over there giving the speech to uh, to the everybody. He's sitting back here in the away from them, and he looks up, and he sees this rat, and this rat is looking at him like, "I like you." <laughs> now this poor old man is like trying to move as best he can. And he's trying to make noise to get their attention. And the rat, like, jumps down on his head and digs in. And you're like, ooh. Damn. Now, they had turned around right at that point, so they run over there and George, like, knocks the rat off. And uh, the guy starts, like, shooting at it. And then they do manage to catch the rat. They got the rat and they put it in this uh, pail. So now you have this old man that just got bit in the middle of his head, bald head, by this rat, which was very realistic looking. <laughs> so um, that's when they are like trying to decide. They're having a little powwow. Like, what the fuck is going on? Something's going on. It seems to be, you know, propagated by bites, saliva, blood, something like that. So they decide that they have to lock the Doc and Paula into this truck. It's like because we know they've been bitten. So they put them in this truck. And, um,. Ed, he then stands up and he's like, 
Okay, now that we've got this taken care of, I noticed something about this rat y'all need to come and take a look at. So they go and they look, and he, he manages to grab it. Because, I mean, I, mean it's, I guess it's all right as long as they don't bite you, yeah? So he manages to grab the rat, and he picks it up, and he's like, look, it's got a lab tag on its leg. So he puts it back in there, and they're like, the fuck? Where'd the lab rat come from, right? Well, now, like I told you, George really starts taking a prominent role in this. Well, this kid... He's already suspicious of Henry, right? And that's when he outs Henry right there in front of all of them. And he's like, he lied. He did not have hamsters. Because when y'all walked by me with that thing, I saw tails. And hamsters don't have tails. Hamsters have this little bitty nub that you can barely see, which I can attest to. Because I used to have a wall full of them. Um, like I had like 20 hamster cages and they were all connected by those tunnels and things. Yeah, it was a thing I went through for a few years, but, um, yeah, hamsters don't have noticeable tails and, um, really noticeable anyway. So he outs him and he's like, that dude is lying. He had lab rats in that tote carry. That's what bit Ralph, you know? So he's blowing his wide and outing Henry and Henry's like, no, that's not true. I mean, they came from Nicaragua. Maybe Nicaragua and hamsters have tails. I guess we know Nicaraguan hamsters have tails now. You know, and even George was like, really? Really? That's the story you want to go with? <laughs> Nicaraguan hamsters have tails. Is that what you're trying to tell us? <laughs> So he insists, though, that it was not rats in his cage. So, um, next thing you know, out of the blue, here comes Ralph. So Ralph is still waddling around, and he attacks them. They kill him pretty ugly by strangling him. That was a pretty good kill scene, and gory as well. This movie is very gory. If you like gore, there's gore in this movie. Um, so, um... George still insists to Jenny that Henry is lying. Now, this is when they get a message like they had in the first one that the CDC wants to come in. So we sort of have a repeat of that scenario. The CDC, uh, four guys come in, and they want them to take, all to take an injection, or they're not going to let them out, the protocol. Um, they're all kind of suspicious about it, but Louise sort of steps up as the first one and is like, okay, I'll take it. So she go, walks up there to it and they start to give her the injection when that damn cat of hers has become zombified and it comes out of her little bag and takes half her face off. That freaks the CDC out. They start trying to shoot the cat. Louise <laughs> is fucked now. <laughs> right? And so you, th you, you, you're not sure whether they got the cat or not, but they were like oozing the cat as it tried to like get away. So you're not really sure whether they got it or not, but they damn sure tried to shoot it. Now, while this is going on, one of the CDC guys, he backs up a little too close to that truck. And Doc, the, the paralyzed guy with Parkinson's, he stands up perfectly fine now. <laughs> you know, if you wanted a cure, you just got it. It just wasn't the kind you wanted. And he like rips the whole back of like, this CDC guy's head off, right? Like, rips this giant bunch of flesh off of him. Um, this starts, you know, they start shooting even more. They shoot him. Um, one of them has been shot, and um, one of them is very hurt. Well, the CDC is like, we're out of here. <laughs> so, three of them, 
they they pull the the fourth one, the one that's been attacked. They pull them to the door, and they've got their guns and stuff. They they open the door, and start walking out. Well, this is where stupid ass Forrest, which you haven't really, he's not like played a big role or anything, but he like looks at Nika, his his girlfriend, and he's like, "Sorry, I'm going with them." <laughs> And she's like, no, don't do not do that. And it doesn't really matter anyway, because you know what happened. The second that they got two feet outside that door, they were unloaded on. Like, you know, they were all shot dead, except for one that was injured in the leg that ran back in. So that boy got killed for going out with them CD. And the CDC guys were all shot dead, too. So, Louise is fair, CD, yeah, 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 okay. So now, that the CDC guy has came back in, they all start running, like, what do we do? You've got zombies attacking, coming through the door, you know, Bev and Preston and all them. So they all run into a storage container, you know, like on a rail line, the storage container. So they all run in there with that, in, with that. and they get the inside lights to come on, and they have this CDC guy. And the CDC guy is like, we're fucked, we're fucked, I don't know what to do, I don't know what to do. You've got Henry, Jenny, George, uh, Shyla, um... Nika, um, you lost Neil and Susan, his wife, who was six months pregnant. Um, so this movie took no prisoners. Um, as they were climbing into that storage thing, Neil turned and he turned because he had gotten blood all over his face and it went into his eyes. You know what I mean? That's how it got into his body. So he turned and they tried to get Susan to come in there with them, but that's her husband. And so she's like holding it and they're like, well, fuck you then. And they close the door. So, you know, she's gone too. So, yeah, you have Henry, Shyla, George, the CDC guy. Um, they're all up in there. And Ed and Henry. Well, I said Henry. So you have them in there. Now, that's when they start really like looking at this CDC guy sort of like the first movie again what the fuck is going on so we have another confession now because mainly because Henry has the gun or, or is it Henry or Ed one of them has the gun like pointed at his head like you are going to tell us right now what's going on so Right, he acts like he's going to, but then he doesn't. Instead, he does a really switch move and gets the gun from him, but decides to tell them anyway. So that's when he tells them that they are not the CDC, that they are the CDDC or something like that, that it's a domestic biological terrorism unit from home, Homeland Security that that's really what they were and that they were a biological terrorism agency from Homeland Security and that he tells them about the apartment building in the first film and this is where you see the two movies joined together so beautifully because remember this movie took, takes place just an hour or two after the first movie so it picks up right there, which was in L.A., and this was an L.A. flight that left out. So he tells them about the first apartment building, how they had found a doomsday cult room in it where someone, um, a doomsday cult, had stolen a virus from the government and had mutated it and was, you know, going to use it as a terrorism act. And that 
you know, that, that was what the truth was. And they asked him, why were you trying to give us all shots? And he was like, because we don't have a cure and we, we only have these different things that we think may help. So they were basically going to use them as guinea pigs with all of these different antidotes to see if something would work. So they were not too happy to learn that. But it doesn't matter to him anyway, because once he gets through telling them this, he decides that what he needs most is a sunroof in the top of his head. So he puts the gun in there and tops himself. You know, he decides he would, you know, he needed a sunroof in the top of his head, like I said. So he isn't going to turn. He's like, now that I've told you the shit you're in, bye, boom, and he's gone. So he that's right after he said, look, I'm sorry that we did this to you, but we cannot let this get out into the public. So you do know they're fissing to take care of this place. Boom, he's gone. So Ed tells them that, wait a second, there is an access tunnel, sewage. There is an access tunnel. That was never covered up here in this terminal. They just have to get to the plans to find out where it is. But he knows there's an access terminal, I mean an access tunnel, that leads to the sewer system of the town if they could just get to it. So, right about that time, something comes through the roof and it's Wiley who grabs Ed, and it's a very, very tension scene because he's getting closer and closer to his face. You know, he's he's pulling him up with superhuman strength and wants to take a bite. So that was pretty tense, but he doesn't know what to think to do. And then he he looks over there at George, and he sees that George is sitting by this green button, and he's like, hit that button, hit the button. So George hits the button, and what it is is it was on a riser. So it rose the storage tank, uh, storage container up and crushes Wiley on the ceiling. Um, and that's how his ass is saved, because he doesn't get bit. That was a pretty cool kill as well. So they managed to get out now. And of course we have random attacks coming from everywhere, because you've got oh, that scene where Nika... Um, Nika's, of course, been gotten. So, there is a scene in which, um, I'm just thinking of cool scenes now. There's the scene in which Jenny is, like, creeping around, because they all, like, kind of split up, right? Um, after they, well, no, I'll get to that. They end up going, that scene, I'll get to that in a second. Let me take it in order. I'm getting excited. <laughs> so, they all go... To this room where the the plans are the blueprints so they're looking at it through the blueprints now meanwhile while ago henry who is nowhere to be found now henry was asking had anyone seen his briefcase so while jenny and shala and ed are looking through these blueprints george is over here and he sets this briefcase up on this table and he opens it up, and he starts taking the shit out, and it's this doomsday cult stuff. And, you know, Jenny comes over there after they have found the access to the tunnel. Jenny comes over there and is like, what is this? Is that his briefcase? And he starts saying, see, I told you, this dude is, is it. This dude brought this shit to us. He is the cause of this. Now... Right about then, Neil and Susan, in zombie form, they attack them. They barely manage to get out of that because Henry shoots them. Here, here's Henry back, where George now outs him a second time. It's like, the first time didn't work, so I'm going to out, out you again. So he's standing there, and they're like, what, you've got Ed and Shyla and Henry... And George, that's that's all that's left now that hasn't been zombified. So they notice that Henry 
has been bitten. And he's like, where's my briefcase? Where's my briefcase? And that's when George outs him again by pulling out this thing and going, is this what you're looking for? And he opens it up and it's a syringe and this liquid. And it's like, this is the antidote to this shit, isn't it? Now, it's at this time that George is like, I mean, that Henry is like, I will kill your little 13 year old ass if you do not give me that. So he gives it to him and and Henry admits it. Henry was the guy from that room in the first movie. He was the one doing those experiments. When the shit went down, when that dog got out and infected that building, he knew that he was screwed and had to get his toys, as he called them, and get the hell out of L.A. So we see now who was in that room, who was doing those experiments. That was Henry's room. And he admits to being in this doomsday cult and admits that every once in a while the world just needs a plague and that they this doomsday cult was going to turn the planet into Stephen King's the stand yeah they they were going to cause uh, they were going to cause this plague so henry is like putting this stuff in his eye you have to like inject it into your eye and he's giving himself this antidote and it doesn't work. He grabs George as a hostage and he takes off. Now this just leaves Jenny and Shyla. Now Shyla is like, you go this way, I'll go that way till we meet up at the location of the entrance to this fucking tunnel that they were talking about. And Ed, he had just gotten killed right there. Henry shot him and killed him. So... That was sad to see go. It was like Jake in the first movie. I hated to see Ed get killed. But, so, Henry has taken off with George. Jenny and Shala, they're trying to locate, navigate, and get there. And that's when that scene I was talking about a while ago, Jenny is, like, creeping around, trying to make sure. Because, you know, you've got fucking a terminal full of zombies here. Um, some of which have not been killed. <laughs> You know, so she hears a noise and she looks over there and she sees Nika. And Nika's like standing up against this wall. And when Nika hears something, it, it was this weird exorcist scene. She like bent over backwards like something from an exorcist movie. She's facing this way, but she bends backwards and it looked like something out of fucking Alien, the way that she did that. Because she was like completely bent over, looking around upside down with her head upside down. That was fucked up. That was a good scene. That was a creepy scene. So, um, Jenny starts like sneaking the other way when she gets the shit scared out of her by Preston who attacks. She manages to crush him in the, you know, the luggage thing. She manages to crush him on the, well, like an assembly line kind of thing. She manages to crush him on that, and she gets away. She's creeping, creeping, and then she gets the shit scared out of her by Shyla, who is, like, wearing this thing, and she, like, runs into her, scares the hell out of her, and she's like, what the fuck are you wearing? And that's when Shyla tells her that the CDC guys, or now what we know as the domestic terrorism guy, they were wearing this helmet, and this helmet is thermal night vision. Not just night vision, but it's got a thermal aspect as well. So I could see them before they could see me, and that's how I've managed to get this far. Unfortunately, she then tells Jenny to take the helmet. And Jenny's like, no, 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 let's go, let's go. And she's like, I can't go. And then she shows her her arm, and she's been bitten. And so she knows what's going to happen to her. So she tells Jenny, take this and go find, save that boy. Get out and save that boy. 
And in the meanwhile, I'm going to give you a head start by distracting them. So Jenny doesn't want her to do it, but of course, you know, I mean, what's... So, and we had also seen Paula get killed. Jenny had to kill Paula with a big claw hammer, which was a good scene. But, so Shiloh runs across the room and runs up on one of the staircases and like screams and is like, come get me, come get me. And then Jenny watches her be like attacked and shredded by the leftover zombies. It was, it was a cool scene. And then she starts trying to find her way to this thing. Now, she does manage to get to the entrance to this drop thing, you know, and she finds George sitting down there in the pitch black dark. She can see him with the glasses. Um, she lets him know. He looks up. He says, no, no, don't come down here. Don't come down here. He's crying. You know, it's like we've given up. And she goes down there anyway. And she's like, it's okay. We're going to get out. We're going to, we're gonna, you know, we're going to. He's like, I can't get this door thing open. She's like, that's all right. And then that's when we see Henry attack. So this stuff did not work. This antidote did not work. Instead, it turned him into more like the thing from the first movie, the old the old creep creature thing in the in that room in the first movie he is like uber you know because that guy was old and he's young so he's like this uber zombie and he starts fighting with jenny and george ends up like seeing the gun land over there because to calm George down, she had taken off the helmet and given it to him so that he could see and not be so scared in the pitch black. So he sees the gun laying over there that Henry had dropped. He ends up getting the gun and shooting Henry, which gets him off of Jenny. And then Jenny finishes Henry off by bashing his head in with a pipe. And then they, they go to the door. And she kicks on it and kicks on this little access tunnel door and get, manages to get it open. And they're going down it. So Jenny's behind George. She's like, go that way. We got to get to the, you know, the end of the sewer line. Um, about halfway there, though, George starts noticing that she's making, she seems to be running out of speed. She's like exhausted. She's making noises and he turns around and then that's when he sees that she's been bitten and she knows it and she tells him it's okay. Keep going. And he's like, he starts to freak out. He's like, I'm not going to leave you here. And she's like, she starts changing and he's like, you are not going to hurt me. You're not going to hurt me. And she, she just uses all of her strength to like not change. And she's like, no, I won't. I won't. Okay. Just please keep going. So he keeps going. And when he gets to the end, you know, there's this grill. And he's still little. He's 13. So he's still little. And he slides right between the bars. And he gets out. And then he turns around and he's waiting for her. But she's an adult, thankfully. So she can't get through those bars. And he gets close to it, and you get this really nice jump scare where she nearly gets him, and she's full zombie now. And she's trying to bite, but she's biting in his hoodie. So he just slips out of the hoodie and stands back, watching her do her zombie thing. And that's when, of course, the whole terminal is being firebombed by the government. So... He takes off the thing, the glasses, helmet thing, and throws it down on the ground. And the whole terminal is exploding on fire. And he turns around and walks away. And you're like, that was such a fucking good movie, man. That was really good that they really topped off the first movie. The story continued. You actually met the guy that was in that apartment. The whole story was complete for you about what was going on. 
Now, the credits start to roll, but right before they do, you are looking at the world through those glasses that are laying on the ground now because George has walked off. So here we have another horror movie for the final boy list because this movie has a final boy instead of a final girl. So it's a cool new movie to add to the final boy list. So George walks off and we're looking through the glasses and what do you think we see? I'm just saying, just say it out loud, and then when I tell you, if you haven't seen this, of course, but when I tell you out loud, you'll know whether you were right or wrong. What do you What do you think we see through the glasses? You know she can't get out the sewer. The glasses are laying on the ground, pointed like the sewer thing is here. So we're perpendicular. Is that perpendicular? Whatever. It's here, and we're looking that way. What do you think we see walk by? Louise's fucking cat. <laughs> so Louise's fucking cat walks by and shakes its little, you know, and, and you're like, no fucking way, man. So George is free. George got away. He's the final boy. And that goddamn cat is loose. And, you know, the first thing that I thought was, damn, why didn't they have a third one? You know what I mean? Somebody out there should make a third one because it's perfect. The cat's out. Now, they don't tell you where they made this emergency landing. But it was a small airfield. It wasn't huge. So it's like, probably like a, a medium, small, maybe a small metropolitan city, a, a small one, you know? You know, like 100,000 people or something, or 50,000 people, something small like that. But um, here you have this cat is loose in this, in this small city. So you know the shit's going to continue. And they could have like, I mean, first you quarantine that apartment building. Now you've quarantined an airport terminal. So now you would need to quarantine this small city, trying to keep this from getting out, right? That would have been a perfect third movie. John Pogue, you wrote this shit. Can't you continue it? I'd appreciate it. But anyway, back to this movie. I was very, very shocked at how good this movie was. Uh, I didn't know that it was direct to video. Not that I'm... I love B-movies. I love low budget. I love indies, so I, I don't give a shit whether anything got a theatrical release or not, but people tend to stereotype things. The acting was phenomenal. Man, Jenny was really good. George, that boy, he was the hero of this movie. And what was interesting about it is that you did not think that Jenny and George were going to be the heroes of this movie. Like I said, George didn't even really have a very prominent role until 30 minutes into the movie. Then he really became the star along with Jenny. Because, you know, at first I was, I was really sure there was going to be like Jenny and Ed, you know, but it ends up being George and Jenny. They are the survivors. Well, she didn't survive, but to the end anyway. So, there was a lot of really cool twists. I love the way it tied up this movie. I think that it did just as well. Because, like I told you, I might like this better than Wreck, but it doesn't mean that I don't like Wreck. And the second, you know, Wreck 2 picked up just like this one did. It picked up directly after the events. This one picks up directly after the events. Um... But this one continues its storyline as perfectly as Rec 2 continued its storyline. It went even more about the demon worm thing, though. And like I told you, I don't really like that storyline as much as I like Infection. So, yeah, that's Quarantine 2. I was very shocked by it. I, however, am not a shocked 
that places like Bloody Disgusting and, um, you know, have given it good, positive reviews, this is a really good movie. Very worthy zombie genre entry. I love it. This one, I guess this one's a little longer than I've tried to be usual. Oh, yeah, it is. But I, I just love the story, so I had a lot to tell about the story. So, yeah. Quarantine 2. If you haven't seen it, you really should. If you have any preconceived notions about this movie, it's, it's above 5 on International Movie Database. That's a damn award. You know, Letterbox, International Movie Database. I don't even pay attention to that tomato place. But they hate horror movies. If you got a horror movie that's still above 5... It's got an award, you know what I mean? So even on International Movie Database, this is above five um, with all of the hate for horror movies. So yeah, Quarantine 2, 2011, Mercedes Mason, Josh Cook, Matty Liptak. You really should. If you like Quarantine, this is a really good continuation. And I really wish they'd do another one. So, love you, miss you, bye-bye. Always remember, never forget, even if you are not infected with the human rabies, you are still a very, very special, important, and wonderful person. What is that stuff they say on the help? You is kind. You is beautiful. You is important. Yeah. I just got that on Blu-ray here lately, and I saw it. But... but you is kind, you is special, you is important. Yeah. You is. So, uh, thank you for stopping by and sitting through this sort of longer one than usual. And I will see you in the next one. This has been day two of Zombie Fest, and I will see you in the next video. Bye-bye.